Welcome to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Molly Watts. If you want to change your drinking habits and create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, you're in the right place. This podcast explores the strategies I use to overcome a lifetime of family alcohol abuse, more than 30 years of anxiety and worry about my own drinking, and what felt like an unbreakable daily drinking habit. Becoming an alcohol minimalist means removing excess alcohol from your life so it doesn't remove you from life. It means being able to take alcohol or leave it without feeling deprived. It means to live peacefully, being able to enjoy a glass of wine without feeling guilty and without needing to finish the bottle. With science on our side, we'll shatter your past patterns and eliminate your excuses. Changing your relationship with alcohol is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast with me, your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from, let's go with an exquisite Oregon right now. It's really been lovely. It has been warm and dry and not too hot, not too cold, lovely, those cool summer nights. If you've been listening to the show at all this summer, I've mentioned how I had my window open very wide, and I'm just going to tell you that my window open wide got shut down for a few nights when we discovered a huge, not small, (laughs) spider in our bedroom. It's actually a known species called the giant house spider. They eat other insects and spiders. However, and we didn't, my, my sons helped me capture him and they freed him outside. We didn't kill him because he is a good spider, meaning that he eats other bugs and spiders, but, uh, he is not invited into my house. And I had to like, really think about it. I got some, uh, peppermint oil spray and sprayed it all around my window. Supposedly that's supposed to keep the bugs and the spiders out. So I've got the window open again. It's been an exquisite Oregon right now. How are you doing? Did you like that little diatribe? Did you want to hear a bit about the big house spider? I mean, huge, giant house spider. I hope your summer has been going great. Mine, I'm really enjoying my August here as I've been sharing my summer content series. And I want to give you a little sneak peek or at least an advance warning here. This episode is dropping on August 28th. Next week will be September. Can you believe it? Oh my goodness. And the episode will drop on Wednesday, September 4th, just like always. However, that will be the last Wednesday episode. That's right. We are moving dates and we will now be dropping two episodes per week. That's right two episodes per week. Now, the second episode is going to be a shorter episode. It isn't going to be the same stuff that I talk about on the bigger format. It's going to be on Thursdays and it's going to be all about, well, if you are in the Facebook group, then you know that Thursdays is dedicated to Think Thursday. And Think Thursday is where we talk about the brain and neuroscience and the science of habit change and mindset and keeping your brain healthy. And that's what I'm going to be talking about on Thursdays. So Think Thursday podcasts are going to be shorter and they're going to be filled with neuroscience and mindset stuff. And then our regular episode days are now going to come out on Monday. All right, so starting on Monday, September 9th. Monday, September 9th will be the first episode in this new pattern. Nothing changing about the what, what's gonna be included in those episodes, but that's gonna be the new schedule. So Wednesday, September 4th, summer content series. The first new episode of the new season will be on Monday, September 9th, followed by the first episode of Think Thursday on Thursday, September 12th. All right. 
Today, I am sharing some really important content, I think, from my friend Elizabeth Sherman and the Total Health in Midlife for Women podcast. And this episode is all about your vote and your health. Now, I don't want to scare you. There is nothing political or we're not talking about, I should say, there's nothing about a candidate or anything else in this, but it is important to understand how policies and how how your vote does matter in terms of our health. All right. And I think that's an important idea to wrap our heads around when we are looking at our relationship with alcohol too. Why? Because it actually matters. Do you realize that during the pandemic, they actually made and changed laws around the the hours that liquor stores could be open to extend them so that people could get alcohol more easily? These things matter. The drinking age matters. What the legal limit for intoxication is matters. How alcohol can be sold in your state, right? That impacts your use. Everything that you decide about the votes that you make, it matters. And Elizabeth is coming at this from the conversation around total health and wellness. And some of the things, the keys that are in this episode that you might want to pay attention to is how marginalized communities are affected by oppressive legislation. It's about the historical context of laws and regulating women's bodies, okay? How public health wins through smart planning and smart policies, how media's role is in affecting health-related social norms. And she gives some steps for staying informed and engaged in the political process, which I think is important for anyone. I loved this episode. I thought it was so important that I really wanted to share it with you. I know you're going to get so much out of it. Here is Elizabeth Sherman and how your vote impacts your health. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Total Health and Midlife podcast. I am your host, Elizabeth Sherman, and I am so thrilled that you are here for today's episode. Now, before we dive in, I want to acknowledge the sensitive nature of today's topic. Our country is deeply divided and emotions run high when it comes to politics. And in today's episode, I will not be discussing any specific candidates or parties. And instead, I'm focusing on laws and their impact on people's lives and health. And as such, I want to invite you to listen with an open mind. Now, you might be wondering what voting has to do with your health. They seem like two completely opposite topics, that your decision in the voting booth has nothing to do with your waistline, the food choices that you make, how you exercise, or your health numbers. But the way I see it, and what I hope to connect the dots for you is, is that our health is deeply impacted by our vote. So to give you some background, Growing up, politics was a regular topic at my dinner table. My mother took me to ERA rallies as a young girl, and my parents instilled in me the importance of civic engagement. I was taught that voting is our duty and that politicians should serve their constituents. Unfortunately, it doesn't feel that way anymore. And I realize that not everyone has this upbringing that many find political discussions uncomfortable or irrelevant. But here's the thing. The ability to ignore politics is a privilege. It means that the system works well enough for you that you don't see its flaws. However, the choices that we make at the ballot box have real, tangible effects on our health and our well-being. This connection between voting and health really hit home for me during a conversation with my friend Claire, who works for the Department of Public Health in Canada. She shared a startling fact about the epidemic of LGBTQ youth and smoking rates. Despite widespread knowledge of smoking's deadly effects, these young people were engaging in this harmful behavior at alarming rate. It made me wonder, what is driving this? And as we discussed it further, 
I realized how deeply our laws and policies, shaped by the officials that we elect, can impact vulnerable communities and their health choices. This eye-opening chat made me reassess how I view the relationship between politics and personal well-being. Today, we're going to connect the dots between your vote and your health. It might not be obvious right now, but by the end of the episode, I hope you'll see how the person that you vote for can directly and profoundly impact your physical, emotional, and mental health. This isn't about partisan politics. It's about understanding how the system affects all of us, right down to our physical and mental health. So first up, Let's talk about the power of your vote. It's easy to feel like one vote doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but nothing could be further from the truth. If your vote wasn't important, we wouldn't see the creation of convoluted voting districts or the placement of polling stations so far from certain communities. The officials that we elect, from city council members to senators, have the power to shape the laws and policies that govern our daily lives. These aren't just abstract concepts. They're the rules that determine everything from the quality of our schools to the air that we breathe. Local elections, in particular, have an overlooked impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Your city council decides zoning laws that determine if there's a park in your neighborhood or a new factory can be built near your home. School board members influence what your kids learn and the resources that are available to them. These local officials often make decisions that directly affect your health and your well-being. State elections are crucial too. State legislators pass laws on everything from healthcare access to environmental regulations. Governors have the power to accept or reject federal funding for programs that could benefit your community. Your vote in these elections can literally change the landscape of your state. And of course, federal elections shape national policies that affect us all. From health care reform to climate change policies, these decisions have far-reaching consequences for our health and the health of future generations. Here's a stark reality. In many local elections, the margin of victory can be incredibly small. I've seen races decided by just a handful of votes. Your single vote combined with those of your neighbors can tip the scales and change the course of your community. You know, it's telling that in Mexico, where I live, Election Day is a national holiday. Businesses are required to give employees paid time off to vote. Compare this to the United States, where Election Day is still on a Tuesday in November, a holdover from agrarian times that now makes it challenging for many working people to get to the polls. Yes, Early voting is becoming more common, which is a huge step, but we still see pushback against expanding voting access, with some politicians crying voter fraud at attempts to make voting easier and more accessible. And when you look at the facts, voter fraud is supremely rare. Your vote is your voice, and it's your way of saying what kind of community, state, and country you want to live in. It's your tool for shaping the policies that will affect your health and the health of those that you love. Don't let anyone convince you it doesn't matter. Next, let's address the idea that our laws shape society and our personal behaviors, often in ways that we don't even realize. Laws aren't just words on paper. They're powerful tools that mold public opinion and individual actions. So think about seatbelt laws. When they were first introduced, there was significant pushback. I know that I did. People argued that it was their right to choose whether to wear a seatbelt or not. But as these laws were enforced and public awareness campaigns highlighted the life-saving benefits, attitudes eventually shifted. Now, buckling up is second nature for most of us. And if you got in a car and your friend didn't have her seatbelt on, you'd be like, what are you doing? The law changed and our behavior followed suit. The same pattern plays out with smoking in public places. I remember a time when people could smoke in restaurants, on airplanes, and even in hospitals. It seems absurd now, doesn't it? But it took laws to change this norm. 
As smoking was banned in more public spaces, it became less socially acceptable. The law didn't just protect non-smokers from secondhand smoke. It fundamentally changed how we view smoking in our society. And as smoking became more inconvenient, many people quit, therefore helping them to become healthier. More recently, we've seen this with texting and driving laws. As smartphones became ubiquitous, distracted driving emerged as a major safety issue. Laws banning texting while driving coupled with awareness campaigns have started to shift public perception. Now, while it's still a problem, more and more people recognize the danger and choose to put their phones away while driving. These changes in perception don't happen overnight. When a new law is introduced, it often faces resistance. People don't like change, especially when it affects their daily habits. But over time, as the law becomes normalized and its benefits become clear, public perception shifts. What was once controversial becomes common sense. This ripple effect extends far beyond the specific behavior that the law targets. Take the example of smoking bans. These laws didn't just reduce exposure to secondhand smoke. They contributed to an overall decline in smoking rates. They made it less convenient to smoke, sure, but they also sent a powerful message about the health risks and social acceptability of smoking. The same principle applies to laws addressing discrimination, environmental protection, and public health. When we pass laws protecting the rights of marginalized groups, it signals that discrimination is not acceptable in our society. When we enact environmental regulations, it reinforces the idea that we all have responsibility to protect our planet. And these shifts in public perception can lead to further positive changes. As smoking became less socially acceptable, for instance, more people supported increased tobacco taxes and stricter regulations on tobacco advertising. The initial law set off a chain reaction of social change. It's crucial to understand this dynamic when we think about voting and policymaking. The laws we support through our votes don't just change rules, they change minds. They shape the kind of society that we live in and the behaviors we consider normal and acceptable. So the next time you hear about a new law being proposed, I want to invite you to think beyond its immediate effects. Consider how it might shape social norms, individual behaviors, and public health in the long run. I want to draw your attention to how laws and policies can dramatically impact the lives and health of marginalized communities. The reality is that the laws that we create and enforce can either protect vulnerable groups or further oppress them. This isn't about fairness. It's about life and death. Take the LGBTQ community, for example. We've seen significant changes in laws affecting this group over the past few decades, and these changes have had real, measurable impacts on health outcomes. Now, before same-sex marriage was legalized nationwide, LGBTQ youth faced higher rates of suicide and mental health issues. The lack of legal recognition on societal acceptance took a devastating toll. But here's the thing. When the laws changed to protect LGBTQ rights, we saw a positive change in health outcome. Studies show that after the legalization of same-sex marriage, there was a noticeable reduction in suicide attempts among the LGBTQ youths. This isn't a coincidence. When society says, you matter, you're important, you're equal under the law, it affects how people view themselves and their place in the world. Now, let's take a look at racial equality and health disparities. The stark reality is that in the United States, your race can predict your health outcomes. This isn't because of biological differences. It's because of systemic racism embedded in our laws and institutions. For instance, historically, laws and policies like redlining, the practice of denying services to residents of certain areas based on racial or ethnic composition, have led to concentrated poverty in many communities of color. This poverty directly impacts health. It means that less access to quality health care, nutritious food, safe housing, and good education, all of the factors that contribute to higher rates of chronic diseases, 
mental health issues, and lower life expectancies in these communities. Even today, we see how policies can perpetuate these disparities. So, for example, stricter voter ID laws disproportionately affect people of color, making it harder for them to vote and have a say in the policies that affect their lives and health. Policies on criminal justice, education funding, and and environmental regulations all have outsized impacts on communities of color. But just as laws can oppress, they can also protect. So the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Fair Housing Act were all crucial steps in addressing systemic racism. And more importantly, the Affordable Care Act helped to reduce racial disparities in health insurance coverage. These laws matter, and they directly impact people's health. It's also important to recognize the intersectionality of these issues. So, for example, a Black transgender woman faces compounded challenges due to racism, transphobia, and sexism. The laws and policies we create need to recognize and address these intersecting forms of discrimination. Let's also talk about women's rights and health. Historically, women have faced numerous legal barriers to financial independence and body autonomy. It wasn't until 1974 that the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was passed making it illegal for creditors to discriminate based on sex or marital status. Before this, many women couldn't even get a credit card without a male cosigner. Similarly, workplace protections for pregnant women are relatively recent. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act wasn't passed until 1978, prohibiting discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. These laws have a direct impact on women's financial security and, by extension, their health and well-being. The takeaway here is clear. Laws and policies aren't abstract concepts. They have real tangible effects on people's lives and health, especially for marginalized communities. When we vote, when we advocate for certain policies, we're not just ticking a box or waving a flag for our team. We're shaping the environment in which people live. They work and pursue health and happiness. As voters, we have the power to support laws that protect and uplift communities that need our help. By doing so, we're not just promoting equality. We're literally saving lives and improving health outcomes for millions of people. We can't ignore the impact of a topic that's deeply personal and increasingly politicized, the regulation of women's bodies. Being in midlife, we might think issues like abortion don't directly affect us anymore, but the implications reach far beyond our reproductive years and touch on fundamental questions of autonomy and equality. Historically, women's bodies have been subject to an astounding array of legal controls, from property laws that once considered women as possessions belonging to their husbands to regulations on contraception and abortion, the female body has long been a battleground for legal and political control. Consider this. There are over 250 laws in the United States attempting to regulate women's bodies, yet there are zero comparable laws for men. Zero. This stark disparity highlights a troubling double standard in how our society views and legislates bodily autonomy. Here are some examples. Until relatively recently, marital rape wasn't considered a crime in many states. The idea was that a wife's body belonged to her husband. It wasn't until 1993 that marital rape was criminalized in all 50 states. Think about that. All of these dates that I'm listing here are within our lifetimes. Or consider contraception. It wasn't until 1965 just before I was born, that the Supreme Court ruled in Griswold v. Connecticut that married couples had the right to use contraception. Single women didn't gain this right until 1972. This isn't ancient history. These are changes that happened very recently. More recently, we've seen a surge in laws restricting abortion access. While you might think this doesn't affect women in midlife, Remember that pregnancies can and do happen later in life. One of my client's best friend and her husband accidentally got pregnant at 45. 
these laws affect all of us, regardless of age. But this isn't just about abortion. These laws send a broader message about women's autonomy and our right to make decisions about our own bodies. When legislators, often predominantly male, feel entitled to dictate what women can do with their bodies, it reinforces the dangerous idea that women are less capable of making their own choices. This extends to other areas, too. Think about how women's health issues are often under-researched and underfunded compared to men's. That menopause is just starting to get researched. Or how women's pain is frequently dismissed or undertreated in medical settings. Something that folks are talking about a lot more with IUDs. These aren't direct results of laws, but they stem from the same societal attitudes about women and our bodies that allow such laws to pass. The ongoing challenges are numerous. We're seeing attempts to restrict access to birth control, challenges to laws protecting against pregnancy discrimination, and debates over whether insurance should cover essential women's health services. Regardless of your personal views on any of these specific issues, the principle at stake is whether women have the right to make decisions about their own bodies. When we allow laws that chip away at this right, we are accepting the idea that women are incapable of making good decisions about our bodies. As voters, we have the power to push back against this trend. We can support candidates and policies that respect women's autonomy and promote true equality under the law. Policies that acknowledge us as people who make up 51% of the population. Because at the end of the day, this isn't just about specific medical procedures. It's about our fundamental rights and being recognized as human beings. Hey, it's Molly. And I just want to talk with you for a minute about Sunnyside. I know I talk about Sunnyside and have been talking about Sunnyside for, wow, two years now. And I want to let you know that that is because of not only the results that I see my clients get, but because I know the people at Sunnyside and I know how committed they are to making a product that really delivers, not only in terms of results, but in terms of user experience. They recently launched an Android version of the Sunnyside app and inside the app, there's new upgrades and ways to support you that really are defined by the user experience. And that is just something that I really appreciate about them. I know you can trust who they are as a company, and that's really important to me. I would love for you to check it out. Go to sunnyside.co slash molly to get started with a 15-day free trial today. So let's connect the dots between societal value, self-esteem, and our health. It's a relationship that's not always obvious, but it's incredibly powerful. When we live under oppressive laws or in a society that doesn't value us equally, it chips away at our self-esteem. It's like a constant reminder telling us that we're not good enough, that we're not capable enough, that we're not worthy of the same rights and respect as others. This erosion of self-worth doesn't just affect how we feel, it directly impacts our health behaviors. So think about it. When we don't value ourselves, why would we prioritize our health? Why would we make the effort to eat well, exercise regularly, or seek preventative health care? It's a vicious cycle. Low self-esteem leads to poor health behaviors, which in turn can further damage our self-worth. I've experienced this firsthand. When I started improving my own health habits, I thought my self-esteem was actually pretty good. I didn't think I needed to work on it. Looking back, I couldn't have been more wrong. I used to think that I overate simply because I loved food. But the truth is, overeating is a form of self-abuse. Sure, eating tastes good in the moment, but the after effects don't feel good at all. It's the same with lack of exercise or other unhealthy habits. These aren't acts of self-love. They're symptoms of not valuing ourselves enough. Here's the thing. When we truly love something, we take care of it. You exercise your dog because you love it. 
You limit your kids' sugar intake because you want them to grow up healthy and strong. People we don't care about, we don't give a second thought to what they're doing for their health. For me, the real change came when I started to have my own back, when I decided that I wanted the best for myself. I began filling up my gas tank the night before instead of putting it off and sabotaging my morning. I started eating better because I wanted to feel good the next day. I exercised regularly because I saw the benefits and the person I could become. And I became a fierce defender of that future version of myself. As I adopted these healthier habits, something amazing happened. I started to see that I was capable of doing the most incredible things. It became my mission to do right by the person I was becoming because she was the most important person in my life. And that's what real self-esteem looks like, putting your own needs and wants at the same level at least as others and believing that you deserve the best because you do. This is where the connection to laws and societal treatment become clear. When we're constantly told through laws, policies, or societal attitudes that we are less capable or less worthy, it makes this journey to self-love so much harder. It's like swimming upstream against a current of negativity. But here's the empowering part. As we work on our self-esteem and health, we become more resilient to these external messages. We start to challenge unfair laws and societal norms. We start to ask the question, who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do? We vote for policies that uplift all people. We create a positive feedback loop where improved self-esteem leads to better health, which further boosts our self-worth and empowers us to fight for a more just society. Taking care of your health isn't just about your physical well-being. It's an act of rebellion against a system that might not always value you. It's a statement that you deserve the best regardless of what any law or societal norm might suggest. And that, my friend, is true empowerment. Shifting gears, I want to address how our votes shape public health policies and why these policies matter to all of us, even if we think that we're not directly affected. First, let's look at some public health wins that came from smart policies. Remember when restaurants were filled with cigarette smoke? Thanks to smoking bans, our lungs are cleaner when we dine out. Or think about how seatbelt laws have saved countless lives. These are examples of how good public health policies supported by our votes can dramatically improve our daily lives. But public health goes far beyond these obvious examples. It's the very design of our cities and neighborhoods. Urban planning plays a huge role in our health often in ways that we don't even realize. So for instance, do you have sidewalks in your neighborhood? Do you have bike lanes, parks? These aren't just nice to haves. They're crucial components of a healthy community. They encourage physical activity, reduce air pollution from cars, and even foster connections that boost mental health and connection between neighbors. When we vote for officials who prioritize these features, we're voting for our own health. Now, you might be thinking, I live in a nice area. I have access to good food, clean water, and safe places to exercise. Why should I care about issues in other communities? Well, here's why. We are all connected. Let's take food deserts, areas where access to affordable, healthy food is limited. You might not live in one, but their existence affects us all. When people can't access nutritious food, it leads to higher rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. This puts a strain on our healthcare system, driving up costs for everyone. It also impacts workforce productivity, which affects our overall economy. Or consider clean drinking water. The water crisis in Flint, Michigan might seem far removed from your reality, but it highlights a crucial truce. When we allow any community to have substandard infrastructure, we're all at risk. Today it's Flint, but tomorrow it could be your town. Climate change is another perfect example. The effects might seem more pronounced in certain areas, but ultimately we all share the same planet. When we vote for policies that protect the environment, we're protecting our own health, no matter where we live. The government plays a crucial role in creating healthy environments 
but it's our votes that drive these decisions. When we elect officials who prioritize public health, we're investing in our collective well-being. This includes funding for research, implementing evidence-based policies, and ensuring that health considerations are part of every major decision. Here's the key takeaway. Public health issues might seem like someone else's problem, but they're not. They're everyone's problem and everyone's responsibility. When we lift up the health of the most vulnerable communities, we lift up the health of our entire society. By voting for policies and leaders that prioritize public health for all, we're not just being altruistic. We're creating a healthier, more resistant society that benefits us all. We're ensuring that our children and our grandchildren inherit a world where everyone has the opportunity to be healthy. It's easy to be individualistic and ask, how does this impact me? But we are all connected. And you're not just voting for yourself. You're voting for the health of your community, your country, and ultimately, a healthier world. And that impacts you because you benefit from the health of your community. Now let's consider some of the less obvious ways that policies affect our health. These connections might not make headlines, but they profoundly shape our well-being. Think about economic policies. At first glance, they might seem unrelated to health, but they're deeply intertwined, as I talked about in episode 176, Health, Wealth, and Time. Policies on minimum wage, paid sick leave, or family leave don't just affect our wallets they directly impact our health. For instance, when people don't have access to paid sick leave, they're more likely to work when they're sick. This not only slows their recovery, but it also spreads illness to others. It's a public health issue disguised as an economic one. Or think about minimum wage laws. When people struggle to make ends meet, they often can't afford nutritious food or preventative health care. They might work multiple jobs, leaving little time for exercise or stress relief. And over time, this takes a toll on physical and mental health, as well as aging and longevity. Housing policies are another subtle but powerful influence on health. Zoning laws that promote segregation or limit affordable housing options can lead to concentrated poverty. This, in turn, affects access to health care, quality education, and safe spaces for physical activity, all crucial for good health. Environmental regulations, or the lack thereof, also play a significant role. Policies that allow industry to pollute disproportionately affect lower-income areas, leading to higher rates of respiratory diseases and other health issues. You might not see the direct link, but these policies are shaping the very air we breathe. Now let's focus on the stress of living under oppressive laws and its health implications. This is something that affects marginalized communities most directly, but its impact ripples through our entire culture. When laws discriminate against certain groups, whether based on race, gender, sexual orientation, or any other factor, it creates a constant state of stress for those affected. This chronic stress isn't just emotionally taxing. It has real physical health consequences. Studies have shown that the stress of discrimination can lead to higher blood pressure, increased risk of heart disease, and weakened immune systems. It can exacerbate mental health issues like anxiety and depression. And over time, this stress literally gets under the skin, affecting everything from cellular aging to gene expression. Even if you're not part of a marginalized group, these oppressive laws affect you. They create a society of inequality, which leads to social unrest, economic instability, and a host of other issues that impact everyone's quality of life and health. Moreover, living in a society where any group is oppressed changes how we all interact with one another. It fosters an environment of fear, mistrust, and division, all of which are detrimental to our collective mental health and well-being. There's also the economic impact to consider. When we limit the potential of any group through discriminatory laws, we limit our society's overall productivity and innovation. This affects everything from job opportunities to healthcare advancements that could benefit us all. Here's the bottom line. No policy exists in isolation. Every law, every regulation, every political decision 
ripples out to affect our health in ways that we might not immediately recognize. When we vote, we're not just deciding on abstract principles. We're shaping the environment that determines our health and the health of our communities. So when you're considering a candidate or a policy, look beyond the surface. Ask yourself, how might this affect people's stress levels, their access to resources, their ability to lead healthy lives? Because in the end, a society that promotes health for all is a society that benefits everyone, including you. So here's where things get interesting. I want to talk about the powerful interplay between media, social norms, and our health. The media we consume doesn't just entertain us. It shapes our perceptions, reinforces or challenges societal norms, and ultimately influences our health behaviors. Consider how movies and TV shows portray gender roles. Most mainstream films center on men's stories, with women relegated to supporting roles. This isn't just about entertainment. It reflects and reinforces societal views about gender. The Bechdel test, which asks whether a work of fiction features at least two named women, not anonymous characters, who talk to each other about something other than a man. That test highlights how rare it is for women to be portrayed as full, complex characters with their own agency. This representation matters. When we consistently see women as secondary characters, it subtly reinforces the idea that women's stories, our experiences, and health concerns are less important. It can impact everything from how seriously women's health issues are taken to how much funding goes into women's health research. The power of representation extends to all aspects of identity, race, age, body type, sexual orientation, and more. When we see diverse representations in the media, it normalizes diversity in real life, and this can lead to more inclusive health policies and practices. Social media adds another layer to this dynamic. On one hand, it can perpetuate unrealistic beauty standards that harm mental health and body image. On the other, it provides platforms for marginalized voices to be heard and for health information to be shared widely. However, social media is a double-edged sword when it comes to health information. While it can spread awareness about important health issues, it's also rife with misinformation. The challenge lies in navigating this landscape critically. Media doesn't just reflect laws and policies, it can drive them. Think about how increased representation of LGBTQ characters in media has coincided and likely contributed to shifts in public opinion and legal protections. As consumers and voters, we have power here. By supporting diverse, responsible media and being critical of harmful representations, we can push for change. And by recognizing the link between media representation and health outcomes, we can make more informed decisions about the policies and leaders we support. Every time you engage with media, you're not just being entertained. You're participating in a broader conversation about who and what our society values. And those values directly impact our health. So I know that you're feeling pretty overwhelmed at this point. Between work family, and everything else on your plate, the idea of adding political engagement to your to-do list probably seems impossible. But here's the thing. Your voice matters, and there are simple ways to make it heard. Let's start small. The next time that you're chatting with one of your friends, bring up a local issue that affects your community. It doesn't have to be a heavy political discussion. Just share your thoughts on something like, new bike lanes in town, or funding for your local schools. These conversations are the seeds of change. Staying informed doesn't mean that you need to become a policy expert overnight. Pick one or two issues that really matter to you and follow them closely. Set up a Google alert or follow reputable news sources on social media. Just 10 minutes a day can keep you in the loop. When it comes to researching candidates, Don't feel like you need to dig into every detail of their platform. Focus on the issues that impact you and your community directly. 
Look for nonpartisan voter guides because they often provide clear, concise summaries of candidates' positions. One of the most powerful things you can do is share information with other women in your life. Share this podcast episode, for instance. Start a conversation about how certain policies might affect women's health and rights. You don't need to convince anyone. Just opening up the dialogue is a huge step. Remember, civic engagement goes way beyond voting. Attend a town hall meeting, even if you just listen. Sign up for your local representative's newsletter. These small actions keep you connected to what's happening in your community. If you're feeling particularly passionate about an issue, consider volunteering for a local organization that aligns with your values. Even a few hours a month can make a big difference. Here's the most important thing. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You don't need to be a political expert or dedicate hours every day to make a difference. Every small action counts. Every conversation that you have, every bit of information that you share, it all adds up. You have more power than you realize by staying informed, engaging in conversations, and making your voice heard. You're not just shaping your own future. You're helping to create a healthier, more equitable world for all women. And that, my friend, is worth every effort. Okay, so I know that I've covered a lot of ground today, and I want to thank you for sticking with me through this important conversation. I know it's been intense and maybe even a little bit overwhelming at times. But let's recap the key points. First, your vote matters more than you might realize. It shapes the laws and policies that govern our daily lives, from the air we breathe to the health care that we receive. These laws don't just affect our physical environment. They impact how we view ourselves and our place in society. We've seen how policies can either protect or oppress certain groups and how this directly affects health outcomes. I've explored the intricate connection between self-esteem, societal value, and our health behaviors. When we feel valued by society, we are more likely to value and take care of ourselves. I've also discussed how media and social norms play a role in reinforcing or challenging these messages and how this impacts our health choices. Here's what I hope you take away from this episode. Your vote is a powerful tool for shaping not just your health, but the health of your community and future generations. Every time you cast a ballot, you're making a statement about the kind of world that you want to live in, a world that values and protects the health of all of its members. I encourage you to reflect on your own voting choices. How might they be impacting your health and the health of those around you? How can you use your voice to create a healthier, more equitable society? You have more power than you realize. Use it often and never underestimate the impact of your choices. That's all I have for you today. Have an amazing day, everyone. I'll talk to you next time. Hey, thanks for listening to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. Take something you learned from this week's episode and put it into action. Changing your drinking habits and creating a peaceful relationship with alcohol is 100% possible. You can stop worrying, stop feeling guilty about over drinking and become someone who desires alcohol less. I work with people in three ways. You can learn about them over at www.bollywatts.com slash work with me. Or better yet, reach out to me directly. It's molly at mollywatts.com. We'll jump on a call and discuss what's best for you. This podcast is really just the beginning of our conversation. Let's keep it going.